Okay, so uh, welcome to our 11th workshop of the summer. I'm actually impressed that we have this many. Um, and today we're going to be looking at um, statistics and Monte Carlo methods. Um, these are methods that we use to do all kinds of things in terms of analyzing our data. Uh, these in, they, we'll see they'll range from things like error propagation to fitting models, uh, to even doing uh, numerical integration. Um, it's basically, uh, you know, our, our, our statistics and Monte Carlo methods are, are meant to use kind of random numbers and the distributions of those numbers in order to do uh, what are sometimes very complex calculations. So today we're going to be talking about uh, what are some basic distributions, talk a little bit more basically about uncertainties and, uh, and errors and noise and what these words mean and why they're very important for, for scientific uh, study and scientific measurement. And then we're going to look at ways that we can uh, explore um, random numbers and distributions using Monte Carlo methods, including a pretty advanced method called Mar Monte Carlo Markov chain, uh, which I think is kind of, uh, when I first learned about this several years ago, I thought this was just magic. Now I don't think it's quite as magic, but it's a really good algorithm um, for uh, coming up with ways of solving for various problems. And I should say that um, several of the uh, the actually, I think all of the grad students are using these methods in their analysis. I think Roman, you're using Monte Carlo to simulate populations of brown dwarfs and cloudlet clusters. Is that right? I well, I suppose not MCMC, but yeah, I can't I can't imagine anybody out there not using some kind of Monte Carlo calculations. Yeah. So, so yeah. So you're using Monte Carlo. I think uh, Dino is definitely using MCMC. Christian has been using Monte Carlo methods for simulating the galaxy. So you can use it. It's a, one of the great things about these methods because you're just using random numbers, it's a very flexible method. So as long as you can you know, very clearly define a model in some parameterized way, you can fit basically any kind of data to it. So it's a very powerful method. Let me go ahead and share my slides uh, so we can get going. And um, again, we'll have both the slide presentation here, but also uh, we'll have some interspersions to work on a Jupyter Notebook, and I'll make sure to send that link in uh, when we get to that. All right, so uh, first I'm gonna talk about just kind of generally about error and uncertainty and why these quantities are, are very important for, for scientific measurement. Um, you know, often, so if some of you may have already taken a physics lab or maybe a chemistry lab or some kind of lab where you spend some time in determining errors, Often that's by making multiple measurements and then kind of looking at the standard deviation or the scatter in those values. Um, and that's certainly a process that we often do even uh, when we're doing advanced research. But the important thing is that that measure of uncertainty, that measure of sort of the scatter in our measurements is really important if we want to say anything about those measurements. So just because we get a number from you know, our observations, maybe it's a flux, maybe it's a magnitude, without the uncertainty, it's not really clear what that number tells us. If the number has a really big uncertainty, then it may not tell us anything. If it has a very small uncertainty, it has a little bit more power, but it may be harder to fit to models. So uncertainty is actually, to some degree, I always think of it as almost, if not equally important, in some cases more important than the measurement itself, because sometimes the measurement is the uncertainty. If you're looking for a non-detection, that uncertainty tells you to what degree that you could have detected anything, and therefore what the significance of that non-detection is. So uncertainty is really important. And I want to make sure we get sort of the terminology straight. And I should say, I think different textbooks will define these terms slightly differently. So this is just how I think about it. So you may find slightly different modifications of these words when you're, when you're going out in your research. But when I think about uncertainty or noise, um, these are what I consider kind of the range of values in which, we, which our measurement is consistent with. So this is the example if we, if we did an experiment multiple times and we get multiple different measurements any one of those measurements fits within that distribution of uncertainty or noise uh, uh, based on the other kind of measurements. Now, there are many cases where we can only make one measurement. So if we're studying, for example, a really faint star, um, to some level, we only get one spectrum of that star because it costs too much money or too much time on the telescope to get many, many, many spectra over time. So even though in, in a simple lab environment, we might be able to make many, many, many measurements to get sort of an idea of the distribution, in many cases in science, we get one shot at this. And so we have to understand very clearly what is the potential range of values that are consistent with our measurement. That's kind of what the uncertainty is, is measuring. And this is tied to the concept of precision, uh, which is the degree to which we can constrain a measured value, right? 
So, you know, again, if I measure a, a magnitude of a star, there's some range in which I know that that magnitude of the star actually is, you know, close to that measurement. It may be quite a bit off if my uncertainty is very large, but that's, you know, we're kind of trying to estimate what the true value is, but the measurement certainty kind of tells us how precise, how able we are to narrow that down just based on the process of the measurement, how we make these measurements. The other side of this is error or deviation. And again, you're gonna see these terms kind of used intermixedly, but I often think about error separately from uncertainty because error in my mind is when you're actually off, right? When you're, you have a difference between the measurement and what the true value is. Now, again, this is a case in science where we may not know what the true value is. Um, uh, there are ways that we can kind of estimate that. And we'll see some examples of it later on. But uh, it may be either the true or the expected value or some number that we think we're supposed to measure and we get a different value. If we know for sure we're supposed to get that you know, true number, then the difference tells us something about the error of the measurement. And this is related to accuracy in the sense, how well do we know our measurement is a robust or reliable one, right? If we're consistently measuring, say, too low of a mass or too low of a temperature, then that suggests that we have some underlying error in the process of which we're making the measurements. Now, when we talk about uncertainties, there's also different kinds of uncertainties as well. There are some uncertainties that just come from the just random nature of making the measurement. And often when we're talking about astronomy, since most of our measurements are made with light, this is often uh, tied to something like the photon counting statistics. How many photons do we actually collect with our instrument in the given amount of time that we're integrating? So if we have a really faint source, or we have a really small telescope, or we have a really insensitive instrument, we might not get as many photons in. And as a result, we're not really sure exactly what the rate of the flux of energy coming in is because we just haven't collected enough statistics. There's other things like instrumental noise, random instrumental noise. Um, there could be just random fluctuations in the sky, right? As light is passing through our atmosphere, the atmosphere is turbulent. Uh, it will deflect light in different ways. And so each measurement we make might be slightly different than the other ones based on kind of a lot of random processes. All of these kind of get folded into a measurement uncertainty. The other kind of uncertainty is uncertainty that in principle could be corrected for, but we just can't, or we just, we just didn't for whatever reason. Uh, and often this will come out from calibration errors. So for example, when you guys were reducing the spectral data, some observers, you know, we're really good about observing a G2 star, a G2 solar-like star, which again is not exactly like the sun. It's a different star, but it's at least the same spectral type. In some cases, they may have observed an earlier type or a later type star. And that difference between the sort of exact calibration that we need can lead to an increased, possibly an error, or more often we'll see it as an, a larger uncertainty and one that we can't just kind of integrate longer because it's just going to be there. It's just an offset that we can't get rid of. Um, and this can also be due to things like instrumental issues. It could be environmental effects. Perhaps a cloud came over during our observation. Um, that's not a random event, but it is one that can affect our data and therefore change our measurements. So these kind of, you know, they can either be errors or just increase our uncertainties that are kind of systematic in nature. We call these systematic uncertainties. And sometimes these happen even at the computational level. If we're looking at very high precision numbers. Even the computers we use can induce a systematic uncertainty that could be in the form of floating point errors or something like that. So these are all kinds of different, there's many, many ways that can kind of you know, skew our measurements or scatter their values. And it's, it's often really difficult to separate between these measurement and systematic uncertainties. Um, but of course, what we do as scientists is try to reduce all of the uncertainties involved. Um, and that would include, you know, increasing our signal of our measurement or reducing some of these calibration issues by just doing more and better calibrations. Now, it's like I said, either both these, both these quantities, error and uncertainty, are really critical for really interpreting our results. And so just as an illustration of this, if I have, um, I have a function here that I've defined and I've just uh, assigned a few values along that function, and in this case, I've got no measurement uncertainty. So if I saw these data as I was making my measurements, I would say, oh yeah, that clearly looks like it's fitting some kind of curve here and I could maybe figure out the parameters of this curve. Um, and that might tell me something about the underlying process that generated these data. But as we drive up our uncertainties, and so this is the case where my measurements, so we'll call Y our measurement, if our Y measurement uncertainty gets, gets a little bit bigger, 
Well, these data still kind of follow the line, but mm, it may not, we may not actually infer exactly the same line, or we might say, well, it's not really clear that it turns down in this way. Maybe it just kind of comes up and flattens out. We start to have some uncertainty about the model because of the uncertainty in the data, all right? So we're not able to infer exactly the same thing. And if I increase this uncertainty even more, you get to some point where, I mean, this is like a bunch of scatter points, right? I can draw any kind of line between here and it would kind of fit it. It could be a straight line, it could be a flat line, right? There's some point where the uncertainty is so large that we completely lose our ability to see the underlying relationship in the data. So unless we really understand our uncertainties, it's really hard to go from measurement to things like data fitting, interpretation, learning about the physics and the astronomy of the objects we're studying. But we really have to understand our uncertainties before we go any further on that. All right, now here's some to some real world examples. Um, I, I pulled out a few that I've seen in the in the past um, as I've gone through and, and read papers or refereeing papers, something like that. Um, this is actually a fairly recent one. This is a paper that hasn't even come out yet. I've been I've been refereeing, so don't share it around. Um, but this is um, this is a paper that was looking for um, emission of uh, light in the ultraviolet from a very cold brown dwarf. And so they got data from the Hubble Space Telescope. This, uh, that's one of the only ways that we can observe brown dwarfs in the ultraviolet is with a space-based telescope, because fortunately, a lot of ultraviolet light is blocked by our atmosphere. That's good for us, but bad for ultraviolet astronomy. Uh, and so they got you know, many hours of data with Hubble to see if they could detect a, any kind of signal that's coming out from these brown dwarfs in the ultraviolet. And they reported in their paper that they see this emission uh, feature that's present out here at the sort of edge of their spectrum, uh, somewhere around 3,100, uh, 31, sorry, 3,100 angstroms, so just below the optical band. And they know that in this region, there is a titanium oxide uh, feature that if it's hot enough, will turn into an emission feature, right? Just like hydrogen alpha will go from absorption when it's cool to emission when it's very hot. And so they claim that they've got a detection of titanium oxide in the ultraviolet. Now, what's shown here is the black line is the actual data, and the blue line is their estimate of the uncertainty. And if you look carefully enough, you can see that the signal is maybe about twice as big as the uncertainty. Um, and you know, and I should say that it's kind of rules of thumb about whether you claim something as detection or not. When it gets to the point where it's just twice as big or even three times as big. Um, it starts to get questionable whether you've actually got a detection. And also, in particular, since you're at the edge of your spectrum, I think many of you saw in the spectrum you reduced at kind of the far edges, there's often a lot more noise because the calibrations are quite not quite right, or maybe the signal is very, quite, very, very low at those edges. And so, um, you know, whether or not, so it's, it's certainly possible that this brown dwarf is emitting a titanium oxide emission line in the ultraviolet. But the problem is that this data doesn't necessarily tell us that that's got to be the case because the signal is too close to the uncertainty. You don't have a high enough signal to noise value in order to reliably claim that, yes, we have a, a clear detection. And often the threshold for detection experiments is something like five sigma. So you might hear that phrase three sigma or five sigma when you have a signal that's five times as large as the uncertainty, that starts to become probabilistically likely that that's a real signal as opposed to just noise, All right? Here, we only have signal noise of two, and I would say not very likely for that to be a, a real detection, All right? So this is, again, this is why it's important to really understand your uncertainties, because if you're trying to look for these kind of emission features, which in this case would be related to things like magnetic field heating and all kinds of interesting physics like that, you can't really say anything about that stuff until you are sure that you have a clear signal and that signal has to be many times larger than the uncertainties. Um, here's another uh, a famous example, and Roman probably knows a little bit more about this. Um, this is the uh, 2014, the polar bear experiment. Some of our colleagues at UCSD work on the polar bear experiment. Um, they reported in a, a very you know, splashy paper that they had detected something called B-mode polarization of the cosmic microwave background. Now that's a whole lot of cosmology that we don't have time to get into. Um, but the key thing is that if we can actually detect uh, a certain magnetic form of polarization of the light from the cosmic microwave background, this is the microwave light that comes from all directions and is left over from the Big Bang, uh, 
that would tell us something about the early stages of the formation of the universe. So people are actively looking for the signal because the strength of that signal tells us about some of the models that could have created the Big, uh, the big Bang in the beginning of the universe. So this is their measurements. And uh, the, these are kind of a funny set of units, but this is basically kind of measuring um, the correlation between different fluxes across the sky, this kind of two point correlation uh, uh, function. And you can see their, their values with the error bars. And I think actually their error bars are plotted here as three or five sigma error bars. So these are actually, you know, the full error bars. If you see it, that's not zero, then that's really a clear detection. And since uh, this was above the zero point line here and actually fits this model pretty well, except for this data point down here, so we'll ignore that for now, um, you know, it looked like they had a non zero detection of this B mode polarization. Um, and if you want to learn more about, you know, the, the, you know, how exciting this could have been, you can read uh, Professor Keating's book on losing the Nobel Prize. Um, the problem is, is that in their analysis, they neglected to fully take into account um, the contributions from the Milky Way galaxy, particularly the dust in the Milky Way galaxy, that can affect how much microwave light you see uh, from the rest of the sky. Uh, this is what the sky looks like in the microwave. Uh, this is another microwave satellite. Um, and you can see there's a lot of structure out here. And that structure is structure in the cosmic microwave background that tells us about the early formation of our, the first galaxies and how those galaxies came into existence. This structure in the middle is the Milky Way. <laughs> and so that's something that's not cosmological. That's stuff that's near home. And if you don't properly account for that structure, which can extend you know, even farther away from the equator here, um, then you'll have a, an incorrect measurement. So this is a case where the error, the calibration error in the measurement was bigger than the uncertainties. And it fooled the scientists uh, into thinking that they've made a really exciting detection when in fact, they've just got a calibration error. Uh, and so Rocco, I, sorry, I missed your question earlier. You said, would you say uh, there's a generally accepted signal noise ratio that's good enough? Uh, and that's a really good question because it often depends on the field. So um, when we make detections, uh, and it, it actually depends on how, how important the discovery is, right? So if we're trying to find, say, a little binary companion next to another star, you know, that's not particularly, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning work. And so if I claim I have a three sigma detection, then, you know, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. But I think that's the important thing is that I, if you claim a detection, you want to make sure you indicate the significance of the detection. It's not just binary. I found something or I didn't find something. It's what significance did I actually find that thing? And Roman's got a good phrase there, extraordinary claims call for extraordinary evidence. Um, and even in this case, you know, I would say, you know, they, there was some argument for some time about this because they claimed that they did get a significant signal. Again, I think these error bars are closer to five sigma in length. And so since they're off zero, that's significant. But this other thing comes in where if there's an error in your analysis, that could throw off all of that. So both error and uncertainty are important things to consider. Uh, when you're doing this kind of analysis. Um, here's another example from a paper I wrote a few years ago. Uh, this was looking at measuring the radial velocities, how fast stars are moving away or toward us um, on the sky. And I was using a particular spectrograph that's in the Southern Hemisphere. And this is a good example where we have a way of comparing to other data to see whether we have the right measurements to measure our accuracy or measure the error. And so on the left, um, there, one way that we did this is we took um, spectra from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that had already been centered to zero velocity, and then we just cross-correlated with those and try to see how much had the spectrum been shifted away from that template. That gives us a way of measuring the velocity. And what you'll notice is that this dashed line indicates perfect agreement. And almost all of these points are just a little bit off the line. Actually, they're quite a bit. It's like 10 kilometers per second. It's actually a pretty big number. And the fact that there's this consistent shift from agreement, all right, and again, this is what we measured, and this is what we expected to measure, so this is our true values. The fact that there's a consistent offset meant that whatever method we were using was giving us an error, a consistent error, a consistent offset in our measurements. So we had a second way of doing it. We used a different set of standards, and that, uh, that data 
lies pretty well on this, along this line, it scatters on both sides. There is some scatter about the line, but there's no net offset between what we measured and what we expected. So we clearly had an error in this method that we're able to correct by using a different method. So this is a way of catching uh, these kind of errors. Now there's still some other sources in here that were quite a bit off. Uh, some of them, not so much. It turns out that these are probably just on the tail end of our, our, dis our uncertainty distribution. But you know, this one, for example, is really far off, right? We um, it measured it to be about minus 35 kilometers per second, and the literature reports it at plus 35. Now, I think everyone on this call can probably imagine what the error was. Anybody want to take a guess? Exactly right. Uh, so Rocco, so uh, the other paper we were able to confirm we got the we got the minus sign right. The other paper just dropped the pot, the negative sign in their in their publication. You know, it could have been an editing error. Um, and so that's you know that's an example of a pretty big systematic error. But that's just a systematic because you know someone forgot a minus sign. Uh, so you know it happens in your physics classes. And it can sometimes happens in research as well. Um, and so again, by having the ability to compare our measurement to what we think should be the right value, we're able to find uh, these errors in our analysis. And those errors are different than uncertainty. They're an actual offset that's not due to some issue with the uh, a way that we're making the measurement. Okay, I think, oh, okay. And so I'll, and the last question I'll, I'll just drop here is that, you know, often when we're making these fits, you know, a good question is, you know, if we if we have a set of measurements and we're comparing it to a model, how do we know that the best of it model is really a good fit? All right. So similarly, when we go back to here, how do we know that this model of the cosmic wake background is a good fit to the data? Well, it seems to match up very well. Unfortunately, the data is just not quite right. Um, here is an example of fitting a model to one of the splat spectra, and you can see here's the kind of code snippet if you wanted to do this on your own. We selected a random uh, brown dwarf between spectral type L9 and T2. And we use this um, model fit grid program to fit it to a set of models. And what it returns is the best fit model, the model that most accurately reproduces the spectrum of our source. But I think all of us can see by eye that even if this is the best model, it's not a good model. Right, it's really off in several places. This uh, gray line down here is the difference spectrum, um, and you can see that you know in some cases it completely it completely messes up this entire band, um, doesn't get the structure right at all. And so even though this is the best model, it's not actually a good one, at least by eye. But we'd want to do something better to quantify that. How do we actually quantify whether something's a good fit or a bad fit? Because if we know it's a bad fit even if it's the best fit, it might be telling us that our model is not the right model and we need to find a new model to represent these data, right? So any questions just about these ideas about uncertainty and error and fitting and stuff like that? Crystal clear, okay, all right. All right, so let's move on then. We're gonna look at now probability distributions. Um, and uh, let me start by, um, again, introducing a little bit more terminology, some of which you've probably heard of before. Um, when, if we actually did the experiment that we do in our lab classes where we might measure a, you know, a voltage or electron charge many, many, many times over, um, what you'll find if you make enough of these measurements and uh, there isn't some kind of systematic skew to how you're making the measurements, you'll often find this pattern in these measurements, you know, this kind of normal distribution or Gaussian distribution, a very common distribution in um, physics and, and actually all kind of mathematical sciences. Um, this is kind of what happens when you have lots of different sources of uncertainty that combine in some uh, independent way. Um, so what we'll often, so, so we often take it, we, we, uh, don't remember that when we talk about our measurements that there's actually a distribution of those measurements, we often will simplify that to a set of statistics that give us so sort of the, the broad sort of base of what this, uh, this distribution is. 
Uh, and there, there are things you are familiar with. For example, the mean value, right? What is the average value in this distribution? Um, you could also have the median, which is the 50% number. You could have the mode, which is the most frequent uh, value in a distribution. So that describes kind of where the, the middle or the peak or the kind of most likely value is in this distribution. And then you have other things like the standard deviation or the standard deviation of the mean that tell us essentially how, how widely dispersed these measurements are. And more often than not, the mean and the standard deviation are often taken to be estimates of the underlying value and its uncertainty. So again, when we're making measurements, we are trying to figure out, you know, what is the value of this thing? In this case, this is a measurement of the radial velocity of a T-dwarf. A T-dwarf has some radial velocity, right? It, that's, that's something that exists, but we're trying to measure it. And to get a good estimate of that true radial velocity, we are analyzing the distribution of measurements and choosing the mean to be our best estimate of that, right? So it is a little bit important here to, to separate out between what is the true value and what we're inferring is our best estimate of the true value. They don't necessarily have to be the same number. And in many cases, they are not if we don't have good enough data or if there's something wrong with the way we make a measurement um, or if the distribution isn't as you know, clearly peaked like it is here. All right. So these are statistics, right? They're, they're numbers that quantify something about this distribution. This probability distribution, as we're going to see, is actually the real important piece. The, this distribution of values, in this case, the distribution of measurements, is in some ways more valuable than these individual statistics. We just use the individual statistics because it's easier to talk about them as single numbers. Now, there's a good um, statistics. Uh, if you're into statistics, there's a good uh, example of how you can be very much misled by these individual statistics. Um, this is a uh, concept called ANSCOM's quartet. Um, this is a set of uh, four sets of data, uh, X and Y values. And you can see that they are clearly different kind of data sets, right? This is kind of a scattered uh, along a linear line. This is a curved line. This is a line, but with one pretty clear deviation. And this is one where there's a whole bunch of values here and then one value up here. The interesting thing about all of these distributions of numbers is that they all have exactly the same mean, both X and Y, exactly the same variance, both X and Y, and exactly the same correlation between the X and Y values, how one increases compared to the other. And the best linear fit to the data are also exactly the same. And, and this is to like two or three uh, decimal places for each of these numbers. And so this is a good illustration that if we use these individual statistics, they don't necessarily capture all of the information that's present in our data set. You know, knowing the mean, the variance, the correlation, linear regression fit doesn't tell us, for example, that this data set just has a whole bunch of values clumped at one X value and one outlier, right? That's a very different data set than, than this one right here. So it's always important as you think about how you report or read into statistics, it's actually more valuable to understand what the underlying distribution is, the probability distribution, than just these individual statistics. We'll still use these individual statistics because they're useful to report. But again, it's, it's very important that we understand what distributions these statistics come from, as opposed to just the numbers. So just a little word about probability distributions. This is uh, just the distribution of values and sorted by the probability that in a given collection, you're gonna find that particular value, right? So it's, it's essentially a measure of the likelihood that any set of measurements, numbers, whatever you got is going to have a particular value when you randomly draw from that. And you can see this kind of uh, pictograph uh, of different kinds of uh, continuous distribution. There's our normal distribution. Here's a very simple uniform distribution. You can see all kinds of different distributions in here. Um, and these distributions are very useful because they allow us to calculate uh, statistics, um, things like the average or expected value, um, or you can do expected x squared. In each of these cases, we're essentially uh, integrating our distribution function over all the possible values in which it's measured. And one of the uh, constraints on probability distribution functions, they're all normalized equal, zero, equal one when they integrate across the entire space. And this is kind of ingrained into the definition of 
probability distribution because the probability of being any one of these numbers has to be 100%, right? So if you integrate over all the possible values, one of them is going to be, you know, something that you choose in your, in your little sample, right? But each individual number might have a different value. So you can use that probability distribution function, which is just f of x here, to compute different expectation values. You can compute the expected value of another function by just running these integrals. And this is, uh, if you get into uh, statistical mechanics in your physics classes, you'll do a lot of this, <laughs> you know, particularly with like things like uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions and stuff like that. All right, but this is just a general statistical uh, property. And again, just to kind of dive into a little bit more detail, um, some common distributions include the normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution. We saw that earlier with the measurement, a very common distribution because at the limit of random uncorrelated noise, um, most measurement distributions uh, go to this in the, the limit called the central limit theorem. Um, and uh, you know it's characterized by having a very clear peak, a symmetric distribution. The width of that is the measure of the variance. And again, often we will say that the mean peak value and the variance, the width, is a good estimate of the actual value and its uncertainty that we're trying to measure. Now, uh, just to work, because we're going to come back to this, I show up here the probability distribution function. That's, again, measuring how likely each number is as we go across the number line here. So for example, in this blue line, the most likely number is 0. And then as we go to more negative and more positive numbers, it's less likely we'll see these. There's a parallel kind of distribution called the uh, uh, cumulative distribution function. And essentially that's computed by walking your way from left to right and integrating up this curve. And when you get to the very far end of the right, you should reach one because you've now gone through every possible number that can be drawn from this distribution. So that's what these CDFs or cumulative distribution functions uh, show. Uh, if again, I focus on the blue line, you can see that it's pretty flat and around zero because there's very little probability of choosing these low numbers. And then it passes through about 50% at zero, oops, excuse me, which is the peak of our distribution. And then it has a symmetric tail on the other side. And again, that symmetry reflects the symmetry of our original distribution. And good observation, Carlos, it does look like a sigmoid or um, a logistical function. Um, a CDF of a Gaussian is a good model for, uh, for you know, either we're on or we're off kind of distribution. And of course, the slope here, how narrow that is, is determined by how narrow our Gaussian peak here is. You can see this green one, for example, takes a little bit longer to walk up from zero to one in total probability. So that's a normal distribution. Um, another one that we see in physics is a Poisson distribution. Um, this is measuring essentially the, um, the chance that we'll see an event given a particular event rate over a certain amount of time. Um, a good place where this factors in is if, if you're making X-ray measurements. Uh, X-rays are, of course, are very high energy photons. And so even the most energetic objects in the universe will only produce like a few X-rays every second or something like that. And so when you make an X-ray measurement, you're often counting individual X-ray photons. And the number of photons you count is going to give you a way of estimating the photon rate. But there's uncertainty in that because there's actually a distribution to how many you're actually going to see given a photon rate because of the uncertainties inherent in counting statistics and Poisson statistics. So for example, if I choose, so the rate is this lambda number lambda here, right? So if I'm going to measure uh, an X-ray source for a second and, I, and its emission rate is four X-ray photons per second, um, the what I'll actually measure will be anywhere from zero photons. I might just not get lucky enough to get any photons to strike my detector. Um, I'm more likely to see maybe three or four photons and then I'm again less likely to see, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten photons because I'd have to get really lucky for that case. So you can see how you can interpret that again as a counting uh, statistic. Um, and this is a discrete distribution because we're looking at individual events. And so it doesn't have a smooth curve like this. It's just a bunch of uh, data points. But you notice that as the count rate goes up, this is starting to look a lot like the Gaussian distribution. And indeed, at very high count rates, Poisson and Gaussian kind of uh, merge into the same thing. All right. Um, 
Another distribution we'll see later on, this looks really computationally complicated, but this is something called the chi-square distribution. I'm not gonna go into much detail on this, but it is related to a statistic that we will often use to measure the quality of fit, which is the chi-squared value. Um, and what this is gonna measure is essentially what is the probability that our chi-squared is consistent with uh, variance that's just caused by noise. If we get a chi-squared value that's too big, right? And again, a big value. So if I take uh, if this k equals two, for example, this is the number of sort of fit parameters for, uh, that we might have, then I would expect a large chi-squared value to be uh, very unlikely. Because if that's the case, then it's actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that as a number to say, but since it's so unlikely that to be that value by chance, it's probably that our model is a bad model. It's not actually fitting the data. There are dozens of these distributions out here. I'm not going to spend the whole time talking about them, but this kind of gives you a flavor of some of the kinds of distributions that you might see as you go forward. Um, now, distributions don't necessarily have to be uh, an analytical form or a functional form. Sometimes they just emerge from the way that we fit data. Uh, so this is actually a plot from Dino's uh, recent paper uh, that's now up on the archive. And um, what I'm showing here uh, from his paper He's measuring a whole bunch of different parameters in his analysis. And he's actually using Monte Carlo Markov chain technique that we'll talk a little bit later. But you can see in the corners of this plot are these distribution functions. And some of them look nice and Gaussian-like. So there's a clear maximum and some range. Some of them are not Gaussian-like. This one kind of starts very you know, high probability at the edge here and then kind of tapers off. This one does the opposite. Um, and so, uh, your actual probability distribution may not be as simple as a normal distribution. It may be something more complicated. And so often in those cases, uh, it's more convenient to identify different uh, ranges within our distribution. Uh, and so a very common approach is to measure what's known as the quantiles, or just as we sort the data out, when do we hit the 16th percentile number, the 50th percentile number, which is the median, and the 84th percentile number, those numbers are because that corresponds to plus or minus one sigma in the Gaussian distribution. But they may not be symmetric. We might, in this case, for example, have a mean that's very close to the lower limit, but very far from the upper limit of our distribution. So this you might see in some of your papers, particularly if you read Dino's paper, you'll see this because it's definitely in there. But it's important to keep in mind that these distributions don't have to be simple analytical ones like normal functions. They could actually be more complex because that may be related to uh, how we're actually inferring something like the parameters for models. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna skip this because we're running a little bit out of time. Um, I will point out that the CDF, uh, it seems like we just kind of this added on thing, but it actually will turn out to be very useful as we'll see in just a moment, because it's a way of actually drawing out numbers from these distributions. Um, and this is the algorithm that we use for doing this. So if I uh, take a CDF that looks like this, this is actually a Gaussian CDF. Um, something that's very unlikely to have these uh, low numbers and more likely to have these in-between numbers and unlikely to have these large numbers. Um, one way to sort of draw numbers from this is to, because the CDF runs from zero to one, one of the things we can do is we can choose a random number between zero and one just uniformly, and then see where that number maps on the x-axis here. So we're mapping, say I randomly drew a 0.4, and that maps to some number just below zero. Now, because this range covers a very wide range of uh, numbers between zero and one, uh, if I'm randomly drawing between zero and one, I'm very likely to choose the numbers that are in this range because it falls in sort of the widest band here. Whereas these extreme values are unlikely to be chosen because I'm only gonna pick them maybe 10% of the time because they only reach down to you know, just short of one and just above zero. So if I just draw numbers randomly for here and then I assign them to this axis, you actually can pull out the probability distribution function that's defined by the CDF. So you can go both ways. You can compute the CDF from the probability distribution function, or you can randomly draw numbers from the CDF and that will give you the probability distribution function as well. So these can go back and forth. Um, any questions on a lot that we've just talked about? some of which is probably new to many of you. 
All right, so just reading Joe Mann's question, there's a, because there's a distribution, only one outcome, counting, say, counting number of x-rays, does that mean even with the same physical initial conditions, individual outcomes are not predetermined, but only in a large set of outcomes could we reproduce the distribution? So absolutely, when you're talking about small number count rate stuff, like x-ray photons, um, they don't just come out one at a time at a uniform rate. They come out spontaneously in kind of random intervals. And so um, you are subject to these kind of Poisson, Poisson counting statistic errors. And so if you just make one measurement, which again, might be the only measurement you can make because you know, you've already used a million seconds on Chandra and you're not gonna get another one. Um, it's really important that when you say count three photons, you take into account that those three photons could actually correspond to a range of emission rates, right? Just because say you counted three photons in one second, doesn't mean that the answer is three counts per second or three photons per second. It might correspond to one photon per second or 10 photons per second with different probabilities across there. So yes, when you make a measurement, someone might make the same exact measurement in exactly the same way and get a different answer. And that's because there's an underlying uncertainty in the distribution of things that are coming out of this X-ray source um, at this very low rate. Other questions? Okay, so I've talked for a while now. So why don't we do a little bit more active stuff? Um, so I'm gonna invite you to um, go to this uh, notebook and let me share uh, the link for that to you in the chat window. Um, and we're going to do this like we've done in several other ones. We're going, I'm going to walk through the notebook um, as I go. And um, you're welcome to follow along visually. I recommend actually following along in the notebook itself so you can kind of play around with it. Um, and we're going to do, just do the first two parts here uh, relatively quickly. Um, first thing I got to do is actually import everything. Um, we're going to be using our matplotlib. We're going to be using the stats package in SciPy. Uh, some other packages that are in SciPy that include interpolation and integration, our usual NumPy, we're going to plot things, copy is just something we'll bring in, and then we're going to use a couple more things as we get down to the bottom that allows us to display the parameters that we measure and also do a Monte Carlo Markov chain uh, kind of thing. So that'll, that'll come a little bit later. All right, so we're first going to just kind of look at some of these probability distribution functions, and again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we've already looked at them. Um, but you have two kind of options to draw random variables from these distributions. And so I encourage you to kind of follow these references if you want to learn a little bit more. Uh, one is in the NumPy package, there is a random uh, sub package in there where you can draw numbers. And so for example, if I comment out this line, oops, comment out that line and run that, I am going to be drawing a thousand variables between zero and one and a uniform distribution. And that looks pretty much about what we get, what I got from our <laughs> distribution there. Um, the stats package has something very similar to that. It has a slightly different syntax. This is the uniform distribution and I'm drawing random variables, RVS, and I'm drawing a thousand of them. And I get something that looks not exactly the same, but pretty close, right? So again, it's not perfectly flat because you know each of these bins only has a hundred samples. Um, and so you're getting some variance along the top there. If I were to increase this to say 10,000, you will see that it looks a little bit more uniform. So the more random variables I use, the more closely I can approach the underlying distribution I'm trying to model. Um, here's an example with uh, a normal distribution, which is just either norm or normal, depending on the package. So in this case, I'm centered at zero and I'm drawing across a standard deviation of one, that's the default size. Um, I think I can change this by changing my loc to two and that will shift the mean over to two. And I can change the standard deviation by setting scale. So if I set that equal to, that's to 2.5. Now I get a wider distribution, still centered near two, but now quite a bit wider. Right, so you can, you know, again, these are just the, the parameters that describe the normal distribution. And then here's an example of the Poisson distribution where I'm going to look at a case where I expect uh, two events per sample, 
and I'm going to draw a thousand uh, samples of those. And you can see that, again, the most likely case is I get two. For some reason, I don't get something between two and three. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and then it kind of tails off in, in this way. I think this is because it's I, I probably because I'm doing a bin size that's not an integer, and this is still drawing integers. All right, so this is just demonstrating how you can use these distributions uh, from the built-in packages. Um, and then SciPy stats also has more detailed information about some of the various distributions. So stats is actually a really good package because it provides a little bit more uh, tools to analyze these. And so if I um, define a Gaussian that has a mean of three, a standard deviation of 0.5, and I'm just going to choose this x value of five uh, to uh, evaluate it, um, you can do things like compute all of the stats, mean, variance, skew, and kurtosis. These are just higher orders of of the uh, distribution of the, of the probability distribution. Um, you can compute what the PDF value is at a particular X value. Since the mean is three, five is quite a bit off from the peak. And so it's a pretty low probability. But the cumulative distribution function, I've already gone past the peak. So now I've gone past where I've picked most of, more, more than half the sources. And so you can see the CDF is quite high because I'm already in the tail, our tail of the distribution. And then there's something called the survival function, which is really just one minus the cumulative distribution function. It's kind of computing the CDF from the right side going to the left. And if you added these two numbers up, you would get, you would get one. All right, so those are just some statistics that are associated with that. Um, NumPy also has some uh, uh, properties where you can randomly select from uh, samples. And so I'm gonna start with this uh, collection of numbers here, this list. And I can do things like shuffle the number. So here's my original array. Here's it's randomly shuffled. I've just rearranged the elements in a random way. I can also draw from this list and I can do it making, allowing myself to replace numbers. So you can see with that replacement, I actually draw 14 four times, which is pretty darn lucky. I should go play poker right now. Um, or I can never draw, a, you know, I keep drawing new things as I go through that's draw with replacement. So you can see none of these numbers are the same, All right? So again, these are just handy tools for working with random numbers and distributions that are kind of well-known distributions, uh, such as normal distribution and uniform. Any questions on, on those tools? Crystal clear, or you're all eating dinner. I'm not quite sure, okay. So let's, um, yeah, oh yes, go ahead. Yes, Bridget. Sorry, what's like, why do we need the random draw with the replacement? A good question. So um, one of the cases I can, I can give you is, um, so uh, Christian is working on uh, studying uh, brown dwarfs that are in different parts of the galaxy. So basically the Hubble Space Telescope just points in different directions. And he wants to select a brown, he wants to basically add up all of these different areas to figure out, you know, how, how many total brown dwarfs are there uh, in this entire area of sky. And um, each direction is going to have a different number of brown dwarfs because some are pointed into the galactic plane, so you're seeing lots of brown dwarfs, some are pointed away from the galactic plane, so you don't see as many. And so one way to get around that is you can basically build a list of all the fields you have, but you can, you know, Inc, you know, basically repeat the field based on how many brown dwarfs we expect there to be. So this makes a long list. And then what I can do is I can say, well, now I just want to randomly choose a brown dwarf in one of my fields and the signs and properties to it. I can just use this draw without replacement uh, because I don't want to double count the same place. So that's one case where we might do without replacement. With, with replacement, that might be the case where I just have a, I've defined a distribution based on a set of numbers and I don't necessarily want to, um, I'm not trying to you know, get rid of the numbers. I'm just saying, here's my distribution. So I can draw again and again from the same place, but I'm gonna base that on how likely those numbers are. Does that, does that answer your question, Bridget? That might be a little bit too uh, abstract of examples. Yeah, that's that's a good good answer. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay, okay. Uh, and Charlie asked, uh, does NumPy shuffle for any given array? Um, good question. I would say, <laughs> give it a try and see what happens. Um, I 
I don't know. I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't be able to do that, but um, best, the best thing about Python is just give it a try and see what happens. Okay, so um, let's go on to our next part here. And this is uh, uh, going back to when I talked about drawing uh, variables here, I mentioned this kind of algorithm for doing this. And so this is gonna be an example of that. And I should say there's a good reason to do this because in some cases, uh, we may not have a functional form for the probability distribution. We may not be using a normal distribution or a uniform distribution. We might be using something like um, uh, Dino's distributions here where there's no functional form. It's just you know what he was able to infer based on the, the fitting of the data. And so one way to approach this is that you can um, create, so let's say you know what the cumulative distribution function is or you can compute it um, based on your, your model. Um, so I'm just gonna make a, one that's uh, based on the sine function here, right? So I haven't done a sine function distribution yet, but we can just invent one right here that runs from zero to pi because sine goes from zero back to zero between that range. Um, and I can turn that probability distribution function into a cumulative distribution function by just doing this function called cum sum, cumulative sum, all right? Now that will produce just a sum over all of these values, which won't be normalized to one. And so in order to really produce a true cumulative distribution function, I wanna make sure that it goes from zero to one uh, over the range that I'm fitting. So I can do that by just subtracting off the minimum from this result and then dividing by the, the maximum afterwards. And you can see that this is a distribution that starts at zero, makes its way up to one when it gets up to pi. And again, it's one because by the time I get up to pi, I've sampled every possible number in my range between zero and pi. All right, so now what we can do is we can create a inverse of this function because this is really plotting as a function of x what the y value is. But what I really want is to map y to x and it's actually really easy to do that using the interp1d function. This is, again, something that's built into SciPy. So this, what this call does is it creates a function called f. f is not a variable. In fact, let's do f question mark here to see what it is. Um, uh, well, actually, let's do this. because Let's you know, make sure that gives us some information. But if I just type f here, you know, what it prints out is that this is a funky structure here. But this is basically a, an object that comes from this interp1d function and it is itself a function. And so I could put values in parentheses after this function, it will basically interpolate between this axis and this axis, which is exactly what I wanna do based on this algorithm I showed here. I wanna draw numbers on this side and figure out what X values they correspond to. So this is how I'm gonna do this. And so what I can do is I can randomly draw over a uniform range between zero and one, and I'm gonna take 10,000 samples. And that is sampling this range, right? And I'm uniformly sampling across here. And then um, I'm going to convert that into this axis using my interp1 function, interp1d function. That's this call right here. And when I plot the distribution of these values, which is in blue, that exactly matches my sine function between zero and pi, All right? So I show this as an example of how you can go back and forth between these PDFs and CDFs. And again, the reason that this is going to be useful is that in many cases, when we are trying to draw random numbers, we may not be drawing them from well-defined functions. They may be from functions that we've had to create or from something we've measured. Um, and so it's good to be able to figure out how we can draw random numbers from these functions so that we can then uh, simulate them. Any questions on these examples? Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna do, we're gonna take a, uh, cause we're at eight o'clock, I'm gonna take a, just a five minute break here. So we have a little bit of a, a rest.
Um, when we come back, we're going to get into Monte Carlo. So all of this has been about how we work with random numbers and distributions. That's all warm up. We're going to see how we apply this in the next section. Uh, Ibar, did you have a question? Because I just saw you pop in. No, I just had a, a really bad connection. OK, OK, well, welcome back. You came just in time for a break. So we're going to take a five minute break and we'll meet up again at 8.05. Okay, welcome back everyone. So we're gonna uh, carry on to our next section, unless there's any questions I can answer now that you've had five minutes to digest a little bit. Okay, <laughs> we'll dive in. Uh, all right, so uh, we're gonna look at now our Monte Carlo Markov chain, uh, or sorry, Monte Carlo methods first. We'll get to the Markov chain in just a moment. So, um, so all of this, you know, we talk about distributions and random numbers is really building up the tool set so we can use random numbers to do kinds of calculations that we may not be able to do analytically uh, like we do in our, our normal physics problems. Um, and so Monte Carlo methods, uh, sometimes it's called random walk methods, random sampling. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're using random numbers uh, and applying them to complex functions to figure out ways that you can um, either uh, compute a, say, a mean value, or integrate that function, or even simulate a system that has maybe a lot of random uh, uh, processes that may occur in it, uh, where you can't just analytically write down, for example, where a photon goes in an instrument. Um, we'll see that example in just a little bit. Um, one really cute way of doing this, and that was actually illustrated a little bit in the last uh, animation, um, is uh, something called the numerical integration. And there's a really great example of this, and we're gonna show a video in just a, a second on this. Um, but a, a good illustration is, is computing pi. So there are, there are numerical uh, algorithms that you can use to compute pi to increasing precision. Um, but there's also a way of doing it with random numbers. And one way to think about this is if you think about the, the area of a circle that has a radius of one, that, radi that area is equal to pi, and the square that surrounds that circle has a uh, 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 has a uh, area of four, right? Because it's radius of one, which means the diameter is two, and so this is two by two. And so the ratio of areas between the circle and the square is pi over four. So if you just take that ratio and you multiply it by four, you've got an estimate of pi. Now, uh, you know, you can write down the integral to integrate the area of a curve. You can do it in polar coordinates. You can do obviously the same thing in the square. Um, it's kind of cheating because you know you're going to throw in a pi in there somewhere. Um, but there's another way you can do this is by using random numbers is by basically randomly selecting different points along this surface and basically saying, well, if it's within the circle, then it's part of the circle area. If it's not within the circle, it's part of the square area. And you can basically take the ratio of the things that were in the circle to the ratio of things that were either in the square or the circle, and that ratio should be pi over four, right? Because if you're just randomly shooting you know, little points in here, then the ratio of pi over four should be the number of things that make it into uh, this circle area. Now, there's a great video for this. I'm gonna let you uh, watch this for the next uh, few minutes. This is done by a uh, physics girl who used to, to work uh, in our group a few years ago. Uh, so let's see how they do this with a dartboard. Sorry, can you hear the sound on that? I think I need to set the sound here. Pi with darts, with the help of Veritasium. So we're calculating pi using this, which is a target composed of a square and a circle inside the square that has a diameter the same length as one side of the square. So the idea of calculating pi like this is that the number of darts that land in the circle divided by the number of darts that land in the entire square should be proportional to the area of the circle divided by the area of the square. If the length of one side of the square is one, that means the area of the square is one. That means the radius of the circle is one half. So the area of the circle is pi r squared. So it's pi over four. Therefore, if we multiply the ratio of the number of darts that land inside the circle divided by the number of darts total by four, we should get pi. So how'd we do? We didn't do great. <laughs> we divide circles by the total. Total is 103. Yeah, 88 by 103 and then we multiply by four. Yes. Is it bad? No, it's kind of funny. 
3.41. <laughs> <laughs> that is higher than pi. That suggests that we're getting more of our random samples inside the circle than we should. I don't know. Randomness is a tough thing to see, there right? Look, Does that look random to you? What doesn't look random is this whole section right here. I do I do think these are centrally distributed yeah. rather than evenly spread. So... We gotta try something else. Mm -hmm. We could try a bigger one and just try to be more random. How, how do you try to be more random? We can throw yeah. a lot of darts in a short amount of time. The sun is setting. We really need to make this and happen. And if you'll let me, I'll do my multi-dart spray. You can do your multi-dart okay. spray. You can do eight darts eight at darts once. Eight darts at once. Three, two, one. Oh. <laughs> Four. <laughs> I think that's a square. Oh, I really don't know about this. Why are you laughing so Because hard? of how ridiculous it is. You don't even know how ridiculous this is. Like that? Like this. How am I doing? Like that? Yeah. Well, how do you hold one dart? I don't know, but this is <laughs> crazy. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Booyah. Why does anyone buy a dart board? When you could do this. When you could make one. Dollar store. Circles, two. Circles. Here is the moment of truth. We have uh, 146 in the circle over a total number of 179. Mm hmm. And then we're going to multiply by four, and we should see pi. 3.26, uh, slightly better than our <laughs> estimates all day. I feel like there are better ways <laughs> to measure pi than throwing darts at a board. Don't do this, man. Okay, so uh, it's not the best way, the most efficient way. And there's a few problems that I think that are raised in this video is that um, in order to do this right, you have to know that you're doing a true random sample and you have to do lots and lots of samples. Um, the, the positive thing is that other than a little ba very basic math at the end, um, it's just counting up the darts. So it's a simple process, but it's a process that has to be repeated many, many, many times in order to be accurate. And the more times you do it, and the more you can assure that your, in this case, dart throws are random, the more likely you're going to get an accurate number. But even after, I don't know how many hours they were doing this, uh, they still didn't get exactly pi, but they got pretty darn close, right? They're not, they're in the ballpark. So again, this comes from uh, choosing just random numbers. So again, it's not a, a calculation error. Um, there are other cases where it might be useful to do it because the calculation itself is really difficult to do, uh, even more difficult than calculating pi. Um, so uh, in the earlier slide that we kind of skipped through, there's, there are ways you can propagate errors formally if you know that they are Gaussian errors. Um, you know, For example, if I'm computing two numbers, a times b, I can, propagate the errors for those numbers very simply. In fact, let's go back to that slide so we can see how that was done. Um, right. Uh, this is our very famous sum of squares uh, uh, routines uh, that if we're adding two numbers, the uncertainty on the, the sum or the difference is just the sum of the squares that they insert these on the individual parts. If we're multiplying or dividing, we're looking at the ratios of uncertainty over the value. But again, it's a sum of squares. And you can confirm this for yourself by you know, simulating different populations and combining them together. Um, but in any case, this only works, this very common way of combining uncertainties only works if we know that the variables have Gaussian uncertainties and they're independent of each other. And there are many cases where variables are not independent of each other. And in fact, this is one of the case for Dino's distribution of parameters here I didn't talk about the middle part here, but this is showing the correlations between the variables. And in this red box, there's actually a pretty strong correlation between the radial velocity he measures and a little offset in the wavelength scale. And of course that makes sense because the radial velocity is a shift in the spectrum in wavelength. So it makes sense that those would be correlated. In this case, you couldn't combine the uncertainty in the shift and the uncertainty in the radial velocity using this sum of squares because these are not independent variables, so it doesn't work. So that's an example where we can't use our simple rules. But we can use um, these for error propagation, and it also works when we have a very complicated expression. This is actually, I think, either from either Dino's paper or my papers. This is how we model our high-resolution spectra, and there's all sorts of prop uh, variables in here, like rotation velocity and inclination angle and uh, the transmission uh, power uh, from the atmosphere um, and getting an uncertainty on the 
you know, the data from this, from this calculation is not very trivial. It's not impossible. It just involves taking a lot of partial derivatives, um, but that's quite a bit of work. It turns out we can also do this using our Monte Carlo methods in a very sim simple way. Um, another approach that Monte Carlo uses is when we do simulations. I mentioned this earlier. If you're trying to figure out how light propagates through an instrument, for example, like an instrument like SPECS, um, there are tools used to model how radiation moves through these materials um, and, and bounces off mirrors and stuff like that as a function of wavelength. And the way they do this is they literally will shoot lots of different rays of lights at slightly different positions and see where they end up on the other side of the instrument. Um, and so for, uh, that's uh, sort of what the model is showing here. Um, another case uh, that we've done in our group is when we look at the velocities of stars. Um, the velocities of stars are distributed in sort of a somewhat Gaussian-like way, although that changes with time. And so again, if we want to look at how uh, you know, different populations evolve over many ages, we can't just choose one Gaussian. We have to actually simulate a whole bunch of different stars in different ways. A really easy way to do that is using Monte Carlo methods. So I'm just trying to illustrate some of the ways that we do this. Um, they may not necessarily be relevant to what you're doing, but that kind of gives a sort of range of, of the kind of approaches. So let's introduce this idea using some tutorials. So again, I'll invite you to go back to the tutorial uh, notebook. And we're going to look at part three here. Uh, and we're just going to go through some examples of how these uh, approaches are applied. I'm going to start with integration first, because this is something that we often do as physicists. We're integrating different functions over different ranges. Um, and so let's do an example here of a fairly complex function. So what I'm defining here is the function uh, e to the minus x times cosine x squared. Um, I'm sure there is some trick you can use to, kind of, to integrate this analytically, um, but it's a pr actually a pretty difficult uh, one to do. Um, let's actually see what that plot looks like. Um, this is actually something like an airy function, as it turns out. Um, now, I should say that there are built-in integral integration uh, functions in uh, the SciPy package. And um, there are two that I use pretty frequently. One is quad, which essentially um, uh, estimates the uh, area under this curve and reports both the value and its estimate on the uncertainty of the value. It says error there, but it's really the uncertainty. And then trap C does uh, the trapezoidal rule, which is a very common way of uh, numerically integrating uh, various functions. So these both work. And so, for example, I'm going to take this function, integrate it between this range 0 to 2 pi, or I can use a trapezoidal function in the same process, and they should give me relatively similar results. And they're pretty close, not exactly the same, but pretty close. Um, and that's perfectly valid if you know the functional form of your, uh, your, your equation. Now, another way to do this is by Monte Carlo method. And what you basically do is kind of the same thing we did with the pi measurement, except for now we're just doing with a one-dimensional function. What we're going to do is just kind of basically shoot a bunch of values across my range from 0 to 2 pi, evaluate what the function is for those numbers, and then um, essentially, you know, some level kind of take the average, right? So if we've got a whole bunch of values across here, as long as I've been very good about doing this in a sort of random uniform manner, then I should have a pretty well sampling of the function. And of course, the integral is of course the value of the function times the little time step added up or the little x step added up, that's the dx. So we can do the same thing by just calculating those values, adding them up, and then multiplying by essentially what the average little dx step and then average dx step is just the range over which I did the integral divided by the number of points that I sampled in the integral. So that's what this little piece of code does here. I'm going to do a thousand samples. Uh, I'm going to draw random variables between zero and two pi, thousand of them. I'm going to evaluate all of those functions and then add them all up. And then I'm going to basically multiply by my little dx, which is 2 pi divided by the number of points I did. If I do that, that goes pretty fast. I get another number, which is not quite right. It's a little bit bigger. But what I can do is I can increase my samples. So let's do 10,000 steps. And I'm getting a little bit closer. 
If I do 100,000 steps, I get even closer. And notice that this doesn't take much time. I just computed 100,000 values of this function, but Python's really good about vectorizing these calculations. You can give an array of 1,000 numbers, and then we'll just run that function through almost immediately. So instead of having to go through the algorithm of numerical integration, I'm literally just evaluating the function some number of times and adding those numbers up. And we get something that's pretty close to the original value. All right, so that's an example of Monte Carlo as integration. And I left here a challenge if you want to play with it to do a 2D example of this as well. Any questions on integration? Okay, all good. Uh, okay, the next step I want to show is just error propagation. Um, and so uh, again, you know, there are formalized rules of comparing, you know, combining variables in ways that allow us to, you know, figure out what the uncertainty of the resulting product is. You know, when we measure, make a measurement of say the, you know, I don't know, the, the, the brightness of a star, that's just the first measurement. We often want to relate that to something like the absolute brightness or the luminosity or the distance. And that requires applying other functions to that, that magnitude. So um, again, we can, we can do this from the Monte Carlo approach by actually simulating what the actual probability distribution functions are that underlying our value and our uncertainty. So let's say I measure two numbers, A and B, to be three and four, and they have these uncertainties, 0.4 and 0.2. And I wanna figure out what is the value and uncertainty of their product, A times B. Well, I can compute the formal uncertainty and that's what the equation is here. So it's fully calculable, but it's, you know, takes a little bit of effort to, to actually calculate it. Um, what I can do instead is I can just create, since I'm assuming that these are Gaussian distributions, I can create two distributions for my A and B values that are centered on the measurements and have a standard deviation corresponding to the uncertainties that I've uh, either measured or reported. And then I just multiply those distributions together. That's it, All right? And then what I can do then is I can then compute the mean and standard deviation or other statistics that tell me something about the combined distribution of those two numbers. So I'm gonna run all of this together, but I wanted to kind of talk through what was happening. All right, so um, what the plot shows here is my distribution of A, my distribution of B. B has a smaller uncertainty. So it has a narrower distribution, right? And when I multiply these two together, I get this green distribution. And the green line is the Gaussian I would expect from the product and doing the formal uncertainty calculation. And these line up perfectly, right? So, you know, again, for Gaussians, you can formally calculate this and, and you're done. The point of this is show that you get exactly the same answer if you just start from the distributions and just combine them, however you want to combine them. And it doesn't really matter if doing this too much for, for simple calculations like A times B, but when you get to more complicated things, like for example, you want to take an apparent magnitude and an absolute magnitude measurement and uncertainty, and then figure out the distribution of distances. This is not something that's, I mean, it's possible to calculate you know, what the formal uncertainty is, but it's a lot more difficult. And so what I'm just gonna do is I'm just going to create the same process. I'm gonna create the distributions for these measurements. I'm gonna put them into the function that determines distance. This is my usual, um, I think that's actually wrong. I think this is point two, <laughs> make sure that's right. Um, usual function for computing distance. And then um, I'm going to combine those two to make a distance distribution. And then I can look at the mean and standard deviations. Um, and there you go, all right? So even though I could have gone through all the calculus, compute the partial derivatives to figure out how to combine these uncertainties, it's much easier just to generate the distributions and then just combine them like they were numbers. So this makes this error propagation a lot simpler. Now, there's one caveat here is that I've reported the mean and the standard deviation, which is totally fine for normal distributions. But if I actually plot the, dis the histogram of my distances 
you'll notice that it's actually asymmetric. And that's because I'm using a log function or the exponential function here. The, the function for distance includes this 10 to the power 0.2 difference in magnitudes. So that results in an asymmetric distribution. So in this case, it's probably better to report not the mean and standard deviation, but to report the quantiles, right? So again, here's my, you can either use percentile or quantile. They're the same thing. They just divide by 100. Um, I'm going to compute where the six, you know, as I run through these values, what is the 16th percent, the 50th percent, which is the median, and the 84th percent. And then I can report out what those values are. And that gives me this range. So they 1.6 plus 5 minus 4. It's pretty close to uniform, pretty close to even, but it's actually quite a bit different. And if I, you know, increase the uncertainties on this, you would find that uh, those differences actually make more of an asymmetric uh, distribution. And so now the asymmetric value of those instances becomes a little bit more important. All right, any questions on error propagation? Um, I'm a bit confused in what the 6.65, like plus 6.65 minus 5.91 um, symbolizes, like what is it again? Yeah, so let me just print out what this Q, it's getting so dark, I can't see my keyboard, what the Q variable is. So what this is returning is, you know, again, what we've done is we've created these distributions and we've combined them to compute the distance distribution that folds in our uncertainties in the apparent and absolute magnitudes. And so what Q here is reporting is as I go from the lowest value to the highest value, where do I hit the 16th percent? You know, if it's literally a list, where am I 16% of the way down? Where am I 50% down? Where am I 84% of the way down, right? I'm capturing the kind of middle of the distribution. And so that's what those numbers are. And so what I'm gonna report is the median and then the difference between the median and the low range, that's my minus value, and the median and the high range, which is my plus value. And again, if you just look at the distribution, so that median is about 31. So it's about here, which looks about right. It's kind of the peak. And you can see that there's a longer distribution to higher values than there is to shorter values. So the asymmetric uncertainties here, essentially yeah, in the simplest way possible, uh, accounts for the fact that my distribution has a longer positive tail than a negative tail. Does that make it clear, Bridget? Yeah. So the so the like plus six point six five that corresponds to the eighty four section. Yeah. So that so eighty fourth percentile again going from low to high, you know that that number is about thirty seven. So that's somewhere in here, right? So basically, again, if I just integrate all these values, I'm getting 84% of all my values until I get to 37.7. So I'm choosing that as kind of the high range of my middle part of the distribution. And the low range is at 25.9, that's about here, right? So I only capture 16% of the values up to here and then 84% up to here. And that kind of is the middle. And again, this is convention. Some people will use 10%, 50%, and 90%. Some people, if they're really extreme, will use 5%, 50%, and 95%, right? The point is to kind of indicate where most of the values lie. And then for Gaussian, standard deviation is good enough, and that just gives you a plus or minus one number. But when you have an asymmetric distribution like this, you need to account for that asymmetry, and you can do that by using these quantiles or percentiles. Does that help, Jen? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, any other questions on, on this point? Okay. All right, so uh, again, being mindful of time, I'm gonna skip the simulation part and let's go into Markov chain Monte Carlo because this I think is the super magic part of Monte Carlo stuff. Um, 
So Markov chain Monte Carlo is essentially these Monte Carlo processes, but with feedback. That's how I, I kind of like to think about it. And so, you know, when we're simulating distributions, um, you know, we're starting with some estimate of our value and uncertainty, and we're sort of, you know, simulating what those, uh, the range of potential values would be from that. But in the process where we're trying to actually say, fit a model to something, we're in this in which case we're trying to figure out maybe the mean and value uncertainties on the parameters of the model, we actually want to know whether these simulated values are a good fit to the data or not. And so this is where the feedback is going to come in. And this Monte Carlo Markov chain process essentially is going to use random numbers to march our way to figure out what are the optimal parameters for a model that we're trying to fit to data. So this works really well with models that have very well-defined parameters where I can write down an equation that describes what my model is supposed to look like, right? Um, if I can just kind of go back here, this is a, oops, this is a well-defined equation that allows us to determine how to go from our model to what the data is supposed to look like. Um, and it also allows us to evaluate. So the other things we need is a statistic that tells us how good of a fit our model is to the data. And then we need some way of sort of checking and updating our model parameters so we can kind of walk our way to the best set of, of parameters using random sampling, using random numbers. Now I want to take this aside because one of the questions I asked earlier was if I have the best model, how do I know it's a good model? And that's based again on a set of statistics. And there's a whole range of statistics that get used in this kind of thing. The easiest case would be, you know, what is the average offset between the data and the model? In fact, we saw that um, when we were looking at um, our definition of error here, if we go back, right? The average difference between the way I measured my radial velocities and what they were reported in the literature, I should, expect that to be zero if I have the right, in this case, model of measuring our major velocities. But since it's not zero, it means it's not a good fit. And the fit in this key, case should be, I should get exactly the same numbers, right? Since it's not the case, my offset is not zero, that means that I have a problem in, in how I'm fitting. So it's not a good model, at least of fitting the data. Um, you can also look at the absolute offset. You can look at the normalized variance. If you're doing um, educational research, this is often called the chi-squared, but I like to call it more normalized variance. This is just difference of data model wired by model. Um, the quantity that we'll probably use the most is the chi-squared statistic. And this compares, again, the data to the model, the difference between it. And this is, again, you know, like, what is the data point and what does the model predict that data point to be? divided by the uncertainty in my data. And this is where uncertainty really matters because when you have a data point that has very high uncertainty, that means this is a small number, that's not gonna have a lot of statistical weight in how good the model fits. Whereas a data point with very small uncertainty, so this is small and this is a big number, is going to change chi-squared by a lot. So this allows us to deal with data that might have different levels of uncertainty associated with it. And we can not worry about the points that have very large uncertainties and really focus on the data that's measured well. So we're definitely gonna be using chi-squared quite a bit. And there's a whole bunch of uh, you know, uh, notation about what's a good chi-squared value, what's a bad chi-squared value. Um, we don't have time to go into that today, but this is gonna be kind of our statistic to tell the quality of fit. Right, way to put it. All right. Now, the basic algorithm of the MCMC um, is as follows. So you start with some initial guess of what your parameters are for your model, and you compare the fit quality. Use that statistic like chi-squared to determine how good is that parameter to the fit. And then you change your parameters, and you want to change it in kind of a, a random way, right? You want to kind of randomly walk around and figure out what's the best, best fit. So you change your parameter, recompute the fit uh, quality of fit. And if this new parameter set is better than your old one, then you want to move in that direction because that's the much better parameter set. So you want to go there. And if it's not, then you just stay where you are. And then you just do this a lot of times. 
So this is an example of um, kind of visualizing that. This is um, in the case of where they've started with three different guesses for the model parameters, and then they've allowed them to kind of randomly walk. And what you can see is that as they get closer to the range of values, that's the you know right range for the model, you can see they all kind of hang out there because that's the place where the model and the data are best matched. And so even if you have a really terrible guess for your initial conditions, the way that this process works around, it will eventually find those best parameters and it will stay there and it will march around and sort of sample the space around that parameter that's consistent with the data um, because of course the measurements have uncertainty. So that could be perfect fits to the model. And the scatter as it marches around the best fit parameters actually gives you a measure of the uncertainties of your parameters themselves. So it serves kind of two purposes, one finding the best parameters and one determining the uncertainties on those parameters, both of which we need to know. Uh, now, uh, there's different ways of that Markov J. Monte Carlo has done. There's all these like, you know, this kind of like pseudo code about how this works. There's all sorts of variations in how you play with this. Um, one example is when we do Metropolis algorithm. This is an algorithm developed by a famous computer scientist named Metropolis. Um, is you compare the quality of fit between your old model and your new model, and you compute that ratio, and then you just compare it to a random number between zero and one. And if the ratio is uh, uh, bigger than your random number, then you wanna use it. If you don't, you drop it. Um, and this allows a little bit of, uh, again, randomness in how it decides which parameters to choose. And that helps it to sort of sample um, the uns in your parameter space. So this is exact. This is just one example. There's many different kinds of like flavors of Monte Carlo uh, that can happen. All right. So uh, let's do an example of this. Um, and again, you'll have some time to play with this on your own uh, in the, the notebook because I think we're just going to do this uh, relatively quickly because we're running out of time. So um, we're going to see how to do this in a simple case where we've got a function that has two parameters. And it's basically just a plus bx squared, right? That's our function. Um, and so we have a we have a model that has a very clear, you know, functional form, which has clear parameters. And so this is something that we can use Monte Carlo for. And we're going to define a fit to statistic, which is just our chi squared. So again, that's the sum of data minus model divided by the noise. Somehow noise is not in here, so we'll have to actually define noise. I don't know how that got away with that. Um, and we're going to start with our true parameters and generate some fake data around those parameters. So this is a very common approach when we're testing out uh, some of our, our systems. We start with what we think the true function is, and we just add some noise to it. right? So I'm basically evaluating uh, x values between minus 5 and 5, 100 of them. Uh, I'm applying this function, all right? And I'm adding some noise to it in a normal distribution. And so let's see what that looks like. All right, so again, this is just a quadratic. So you get something that looks kind of like a quadratic, but it's clearly got a little bit extra noise in it, but we can tell by I that it's a quadratic function, um, but there's just a little bit of scattered around that function. Okay, so I have to actually, uh, fix some things in here because I have to add in my noise and my values. Okay, so here's what we're going to do in terms of the process. So again, thinking back about the algorithm I talked about, I'm going to start with an initial guess. These are my initial parameters. I'm going to guess that the first parameter is somewhere in the minimum down here. So I'm just going to take the minimum value. And um, I'm just making a random guess about the quadratic uh, uh, constant in front here. Um, and then I'm going to compute the fit, fit, fit statistic for that and start to populate a set of arrays. It's going to sort of hold on to these parameters and these fit statistics. It allows us to go back and kind of see the history of how this fit happened. Then I'm going to define the number of steps. I'm going to do my Mark, Monte Carlo Markov chain. And I should say there are some you know, statistical ways of determining what number of steps you really want to use. Uh, we're going to keep it simple and just decide uh, in advance how many steps we're going to do. 
And we're going to set the scale for how we jump around between our uh, random polynomials. All right, so that's what this uh, PR, PRAND stands for. And then this is the entire function. So this one of the reasons that Markov chain Monte Carlo is really great is that it's actually really easy to code up. It's you know a few lines of code, and you have a very flexible and powerful way of fitting any function, uh, no matter what the the functional form is, as long as it has some clear parameters. So I'm going to step through my uh, thousands, ten thousand steps here. I'm going to step through each of my parameters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first copy the last parameter set that I had used. And then I'm just going to update one of those parameters by essentially just applying a, a random jump using a normal distribution where I'm using PRAND to sort of scale the size of that jump. Right. So again, I'm just doing random walks. Right. I'm just randomly choosing how far to, to step around here. Then I compute the fit, to, fit statistic for that. And then I'm here's where I'm comparing between the ratio of my original fit, my, or sorry, say my last fit. Um, I just realized I want to do, it's funny that I see all my errors as I'm describing it. Um, I'm gonna choose the last um, uh, value of my fit statistic compared to my original, uh, the new value. I'm gonna compare that to this just random number drawn between zero and one. This is the metropolis um, uh, method for doing this. And if it is, I'm going to go ahead and replace my current running parameter set with the new parameters that I just computed. Actually, I see that's it's actually okay that I keep it as zero. It's still fine. Okay. And then I'm just going to add this new set of parameters in the new statistic to this list that I'm keeping track of these values. All right. So that's the entire algorithm. And then uh, one of the things that we can also do is, you know, knowing that if I make an initial first guess, the initial kind of walk around might not actually sample the best parameters. So what I can do is I can burn off, say, the first half of my parameter list. So I'm going to clean out the first half of this because I'm going to assume that the first, you know, several steps, I was just kind of in the wrong place in my parameter space and I hadn't quite figured out where the, the right value is. So I'm literally burning in. Uh, burning out, burning in or burning or whatever, uh, the first half of the parameters. So that's what all these pieces look like. So there's you know, a lot going on. That's why I want to take some time to describe it. But the key thing is that this is actually a pretty short program. Um, but it's going to work. Uh, it's actually going to work pretty well. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And um, it's already done. <laughs> it's just super fast. It doesn't take very long at all. And uh, this next block is just to kind of see what my best parameters are. So it's going to go through. Is it going to find um, the um, the compare the best value to the mean of my uh, all my parameter values for each of these parameters? So again, there's two parameters in my function. So it's just going to compute the mean and standard deviation of, of the list of, of variables that's computed. And then I'm going to plot it. So that's what that's what we're looking at here. So remember that you know I put this in with a true value of three and a, a three and 0.5. That was my parameters. What I get out is 4.15 and 0.43, and I also have uncertainties. And these numbers are consistent with my initial starting point within the uncertainties. So at least formally, this is a good fit. Um, the other thing that's shown here is the best fit parameters, or at least the average fit parameters, are right here. You can see it's close. It's not perfect. It looks like it kind of undershoots the uh, bottom of this curve here a little bit. Um, these gray lines, by the way, are just randomly drawing from the different parameter sets because again, it's wandering around the different parameters. So you can see sometimes it even gets the uh, the slope completely incorrect um, in some of these guesses. But on average, it kind of converges to something that's pretty close to the data. And again, there was no active fitting of the curve. It was just trying out different parameters, but with some feedback to tell me whether I'm getting closer to my um, best fit to the data um, as possible. Um, another plot you can use is a corner plot. This We actually saw this in uh, Dino's plot. This is showing the um, correlation between the two parameters and the distributions. 
And notice, by the way, that these distributions are very much not uh, nice, normal distributions. The, the slope looks pretty good. And indeed, we got pretty close to the slope. The real value is 0.5, and we're at 0.46, so that's not too bad. But the offset value seems to be kind of double value. It looks like there's a peak here, but there's also kind of another uh, part of the distribution here. So it's not a great um, fit for that particular parameter, but a pretty good fit for the other parameter. So this also allows you some chance to see, you know, what parameters can we really fit very well and which parameters may be less certain. Um, and, you know, just, you know, based on the sort of the tightness of the distribution effect that's peaked means that we've got a very good measurement for this, but a sort of iffy measurement for this other parameter. Uh, and then one more thing I'll show is that since I've saved all of those different parameters and the quality of fit, I can see how that varied over the course of the, um, the Markov chain march. And you can see that, you know, that first parameter, which wasn't fit very well, did wander quite a bit, right? It went up and down quite a lot. So something about how I'm fitting that just didn't work very well. Whereas the second parameter was very nicely constrained throughout the entire time. And occasionally we would have pretty large departures. So this is again, the quality of fit. You can see that this is a pretty big scale. So sometimes it was really off. And you know, there's things we can do, like we can, for example, clean out all of the really poor fits to the data and focus just on the, the best, say, 10% you know, of the fits. And that would give me an even better constraint on what the parameters are. So there's different ways of sort of cutting down uh, this random march to really get to the best fit parameters. All right, so any questions on, on that example? either lost all of you <laughs> or I was just a fantastic lecturer and you got it all. Rocco's giving me the thumbs up. Thanks, Rocco. Okay. And Jamon, thanks for being honest about having to rewatch it. Okay. That's good. But well, that's good. And I, and I do encourage you to practice it. So, you know, you can go up here and change the function to something else and see what happens when you try different kinds of functions. I should say Monte Carlo in general is actually not that fantastic for polynomials because when you change, for example, the quadratic, the, you know, the other parameter will be completely off. And so you'll get a really bad fit. And so there are some functions where this works a little bit better and, and others that it doesn't. And sometimes just reforming the equation might make it converge a little bit better on uh, what you're trying to do. Um, you know, for example, I take the, if I take the log of this function, um, then I have a linear equation and it actually does pretty good with linear equations. So there's different ways that you can kind of play with this as well. Um, let me show you one more variation. This is a program called MC. So, you know, I wrote this very simple and honestly super basic Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo. It still did a really good job of finding the right parameters, at least getting pretty close. Uh, but it had obviously problems. Um, and so, you know, folks smarter than I have gone through and, and developed more advanced Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo routines. And one of the industry standards is this program called MC. Um, and it's written by Daniel For Foreman Mackey. I think I've misspelled his name. Daniel. Um, and uh, you can learn more about it at either the GitHub site, and there's also a, um, a work example using this. So uh, I'm gonna walk actually through the work example here just so you kind of see how it works. So in this example, what we're looking at is, the, um, is a fit to the, uh, a line. So you've got a bunch of data and we're fitting a line to that data. And um, the, uh, there's, a, there's two terms, there's the slope here, there's the offset, and then um, there is this other, uh, scale factor that kind of scales the, um, the noise, right? So you'll see that down here, there's going to be, we're generating some synthetic data just like we did above, and there's kind of a scale factor that scales the noise. In fact, what it does is it tells us how the noise varies with a, the value. So there's kind of three parameters that determines this data set, the actual sort of line, 
and then something that tells us how the noise scales with the, uh, the value of the data. All right, so we start with those two parameters and we generate some synthetic data so we can see how this works. And so let's see what that looks like. All right, so here is our linear fit. Here is our data and you can see that uh, as we get to larger Y values, actually both small and large values, it seems to drive up the noise a little bit more. Right, so there's, there's a pretty complicated function because it's got there's kind of a lot going on here. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to first look at the results from the built-in functions from Python. And Python has a lot to do linear fits because that's a very common thing to do in science is fit a couple variables to lines. So one example is the linear least squares fit. And you can there's a nice reference for this uh, that uh, Foreman Mackey wrote some time ago. Um, this uses a bunch of different codes in NumPy. I don't have time to go through all of them, but this is kind of computing the um, best fit parameters for the, uh, the again, the, the slope and the offset and computing through the covariance. Again, take a look at this uh, uh, paper for this. But you can see that when I do this, it computes this line, which is the red line, which is pretty close, although a bit off in the slope and a bit off in the offset. Right. And this did not take into account that the noise changed with, with, uh, with value. All right, so that's what we get from least squares fit. Here's another um, way we can do this. We can, so as we move forward here, we're going to define a fit statistic. And often in uh, packages like this, these fit statistics are done in a logarithmic scale. Because if I go back to what I did above, Again, this was my fit statistic, and you notice that it jumps to really big values, right? It goes between zero and 40,000 here, and sometimes jumps up really fast. So when you have this big range of data, one way you can sort of deal with that is to take the log of your values so that you kind of reduce this to a, a, a smaller scale. So um, in the MC framework, they often define the fitting statistic in a log scale. This is log likelihood. And if you look closely, you'll actually see some of the elements of our chi-squared fit. Here's y minus model squared. And there's a inverse sigma squared. So this is one over sigma squared. So this is actually just rewriting chi-squared, but in a logarithmic form. So it looks a little bit different, but this is still using chi-squared as our fit statistic. So if we define that, we can also use other in, uh, built-in functions in SciPy to optimize functions. There's a optimize package and you can follow that looking at this link here. Um, this, uh, again, I'm not gonna go through great detail of this, but there's kind of other um, uh, documentation how you use this uh, function to fit a best fit line. Um, if I run that, we get something that looks almost identical, a red line that's just a little bit off because um, it's kind of skewed by the noise uh, from the data. All right, so um, that's all normal line fitting. There's a whole bunch of uh, routines based on this because it's a very common um, uh, process. But the MC, so we've defined our fitting statistic. There's another um, statistic that defines the priors, which is the range of parameters that we are going to use to assume that our best fit parameter falls in. And so you can see here that we are constraining our slope to be between minus five and five, and our offset between zero and 10, and this F factor that scales the noise between uh, minus 10 and one, well, those is log, so it's 10 to, the, 10 to that. And so essentially, as long as it's within these ranges, then it will go ahead and you can you know, go to the computation. If it's not, then it says, this is really off, and I'm gonna make the, the fitting statistic be you know, crazy, crazy small. Uh, minus infinity. Um, so that tells you that this is definitely not uh, the right uh, uh, variable. And then there's a probability statistic that combines our prior here and our fitting statistic. So again, this is all kind of the standard way that this is put together. Um, and then we create then a set of uh, uh, walkers. So, you know, what I showed in the the Metropolis uh, example that I just coded myself, that was just one 
random walker that was trying to find its way to the parameters. A more efficient way is to have lots of initial walkers that start with different initial conditions and see if they converge to the same answer. That's actually a good important test to make sure that our fit is actually converging to one answer as opposed to finding sort of minima in our parameter space. So in this case, we're using 100 walkers. And um, this is just setting that up. This is how we set up the uh, code to run these walkers. You see our number of walkers, our dimensions. There's our log probability function that combines the prior and the fitting statistic. And this is our x values, y values, and uncertainties. So let me actually enter all these things in so I can code them up. All right. And this is doing all the work. So it runs pretty quickly. And you end up with a uh, large number of samples here um, that's run through this MCMC code kind of behind the, the, behind the, the code. Um, so we have to actually look at our results here. So we're going to look at the chains like we did above. Bring it there. All right, so these are our three parameters, our slope, our offset, and this noise scale. And you can see, actually, this is all pretty constant through here. Now, what's hard to see is that there's a dashed line under here. That's the actual true value. And you can see it's actually a little bit offset from that true value, partly because of the noise. And we can also look at the parameter fits here. And you can see that unlike my Metropolis scenes, we have very nicely constrained parameters for this linear fit, although they're actually a little offset. Uh, and if you go back and you look at the linear fit thing, you'll see these are actually offset in exactly the same way as the other line fit was offset. So it did exactly the same thing as a normal, you know, very rigorous noise-based linear fitting code, but it did it just with random numbers. So again, you know, for line fitting, this seems like overkill because we have functions for line fitting. But if we have a complicated function like Dino's fit function, something like this can be run and converge on the right values pretty quickly. All right, so I think I've, I think I've gone, uh, uh, you know, I, I've probably gone a little bit over folks' head at nine o'clock at night because it's you know, a little bit late. Um, so what I want to encourage you is to go back and play with this uh, Python notebook on your own. Change the functions that you're fitting, change the variables, and particularly for MC, if you're really into this, you want to maybe take a look at the MC page to get a little bit more information on how that code works. Um, what I've given you is kind of the basics and how to set these things up and you know how these algorithms basically work. There's a lot more detail out there. There's whole books written about Markov chain Monte Carlo if you really want to get into the, the nitty gritty. Um, but even with a very basic uh, algorithm, you can actually start to fit pretty complex functions um, using these tools. And um, you know, again, we may or may not get to that in the summer, but this is a nice tool to kind of have in the back of your pocket as you're going forward and doing other scientific products because it doesn't matter if you're looking at stars or you're measuring DNA or you're trying to optimize an engineering device. These random number methods are very powerful and very flexible. And so you can apply them to a lot, a lot of different kinds of problems. All right, any questions? Rocco, you're fantastic with the reactions, great. Um, all right, well, so again, if this, you know, if a lot of this went way over your head, don't worry, um, the, this will be recorded. You can go back and watch it. You can play around with the Python notebook. Um, and, you know, you're gonna see other examples about Markov Chain Monte Carlo uh, online if you wanna get more involved. Again, the idea is to kind of see how these tools work and. Uh, it turns out these are, again, very flexible methods, and, and I hope that uh, if you don't get to use them this summer, you'll get a chance to use them sometime in the future. Okay, well, have a great night, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pause.